September 2nd, 1868. Arrived in Cheyenne in the new Wyoming Territory early this morning on the new Union Pacific Line. Has been three years since I rode the locomotive. Didn't realize it would remind me so strongly of Atlanta. I spent the last day of the journey with the phantom smell of blood and iron in my nostrils and the bile rising at the back of my throat. But it is over. God willing, I'll never have to ride the train again. Cheyenne is newborn and mewling like a babe. Immigrants from the east and across the seas team here, filling the streets with a babel of tongues and the raucous laughter of drunken listless youths. The hound I purchased before leaving tugs at his leash with delight at the sights and sound. The plot of land is still two days ride across the border and to the southwest, but True to his word, the man from the bank has hired a guide to take me there. Sent a last letter to my wife and boys with instructions to meet me here in the spring, and have purchased a wagon and the supplies for construction. The guide, a half-Indian fellow, I'd wager by the appearance, but civilized in tongue, has helped me hire two young men, an Irishman with a sullen, chinless face, and a German watery-eyed and stinking of bourbon. Both despicable wretches, but they have agreed to work for a pittance, and both claim to have experience in homesteading. They may intend to kill me, seeing an easy mark in a naive settler, but I do not fear these drunken children. I've seen a generation of these boys spilled open, and I know what they're made of. September 8th 1868. I've crossed into the free territory of Colorado after a day of the level prairie of warm wind of Wyoming into the front range. This land is wild, in some strange way and like nothing I'd ever seen before. We were following a river through the shadow of two jagged peaks, and we camped tonight just a few miles from the parcel of land. I requested remote, and by God, the bank man did not fail me. The crowd and the Irishman grew demure and quiet without spirits, and I see no possibility of violence in them now, lest they suspect me of hoarding whiskey. They'll do fine quick labor, and return to Cheyenne to drink and fuck the profits. These are men of dust and serve only this purpose. To think, good men like me fought and died to protect these jackals from the reach of Lincoln's tyranny. God grind his bones. I'll be free of that monster soon. And if it should spread its federal borders this far, then I'll burn my new home to the ground and move west yet again. Sons of bitches will have to push me into the sea before I swear fealty. I found a skull just off the deer trail when I went to make water. It was bleached white and divorced from jawbone and neck. I try not to view this as portent. Tomorrow we should reach the plot and begin. September 9th, 1868. The bank man has lied to me, a foul stuffed pig. The plot of land, clearly identified by compass and map is not the idyllic grove his words painted. But tis a swamp. A sodden hollow filled with mud and grass, ringed with broken and dying pines. I would flay my guide alive if I thought his wretch of an employer might feel a sting. I am determined to homestead here, however. This may not be the land I desired, but it is mine by God. The Irishman and the German fell trees for me, and I've found the highest place where the earth is damp the least. I will tame this land. The hound does not like it here, though. He growls at the horizon and pads in small, tight circles, looking always behind him. September 10th, 1868. The guide has vanished in the night. He was to spend the next few days properly mapping the borders of my land, but he has fled. Worse still, the Irishman and the Kraut 
have grown skittish at his departure. The German tells a tale of hearing screaming in the woods last night, but in morning light, the guide's tent and belongings were packed away and gone. It shames me to admit, but my first night was filled with unease. There's something about this land, unlike any in the east. It seems to breathe and pulse around me, like it watches me with a cold intelligence. The trees sing softly in the breeze, and in the smallest hours, when sleep had fled into the dark, I fancied I heard whispering voices in the breeze. I'll share none of this with the laborers. They're weak and callow enough as it is. If superstition infects them, I'll be left alone here while they flee. September 14th My hands bleed at the end of each day. I drive the boys hard, but myself harder. The skeleton of the cabin is complete now, but there's much more work to do. I do not think they have the stomach for real work, these dogs. They're slow, now that they see the rough outline, believing their work is at an end. I suppose a pig may recognize a barn by sight, but we would hope too much to think they understand a crossbeam and a proper roof. My dread in the nights has deepened to a level I scarcely am willing to accept. In the ebon black of night, I'm an immigrant from a dead land into one that lives. Yet, each creak of the trees seemed to come from my own shuddering spine. While I hear no birds or beasts during the day, a fact that only now seems to have pertinence, the night is alive with the rustle in the bush. Occasionally, I hear the crashing stomp of one of the drunkards slogging to the tree line to void his bladder. The boys have indeed brought out a stash of bottles, and they have taken to drinking themselves into a stupor each night, rationing the stuff to fend off the night. I won't speak of the likes of them, but I know they share my unease. Their eyes are hollow each morning, and I catch them whipping around to look wide-eyed into the trees as if they'd seen their deaths coming on padded feet. I've taken to leash in the hound at the edge of the clearing. He whimpers and shudders throughout the night, and when he wakes, he howls and barks at the sky. If he cannot make himself useful when the need to hunt arises, well, I'll have to put a bullet in his noisy skull. September 15th. The German is gone. I suspected at first that he had turned his tail up back to Cheyenne. I was wise not to pay him up front. His companion, sick with fear and delusion, entered the cabin and shook me awake to tell me that he had been carried off in the night, the same as our guide. I boxed his ears and dragged him to their camp, whereas I suspected his belongings were gone. But the wretch refused to work until we looked for his partner. We combed the woods all day with no sign of the German. Some of the night's alien gloom lingers in the woods throughout the day, and I must confess I was leaping at the smallest noises. The hound, finding his purpose again, tracked the German's trail, only to find that it looped around the grove several times, spiraling outward from the camp. The trail soon vanished, and the hound began to strain at the leash pleading for me to return him to the safety of our clearing. With the cabin in sight at the edge of the trees, I made an unsettling discovery. At twice the level of a man's height, a canvas rucksack hung from the dead branches of a mass of gray and rotting pine. More unsettling, when I opened the satchel, I found the clothes of a much shorter man than I had expected. This was our guide's bag. I'll not tell the poor, fear-crazed Irishman when he returns. To credit his bravery, he still remains in the woods as night falls. I hear him shouting his companion's name as he follows the spiraling trail with no end. He's a fool, but 
braver than I believed. The dark has swept over the land like a sackcloth of revelations, and there is ice in my blood. I can no longer hear the Irishman now. The sounds of the night, the still unfamiliar tapestry of living bodies, and the creak of the towering pines drown out his cries. I feel a bit foolish, but I do fear for his safety. September 16th Woke in the moonless night to the sounds of screaming, far in the distance. A whimpering, tearing shriek that stilled even the noises of the dark. I laid, unable to move in the bedroll on the wooden floor, unsure for a time if I had actually ever left the battlefield hospital of Atlanta and waiting for canyon and musket fire. But it was only one lone boy screaming in the dark, and I was helpless to save him. I clutched the rifle close, and the hound lay shivering at my side. The boy screamed, his voice coming from every direction over the course of several hours before it dissipated into a soft whimper. We could do little but wait for daybreak. In the light of day, I forced the hound back into the maw of the woods. I feel like wilting and crying each time I contemplate leaving the swampy ring of trees, but even an Irishman deserves a cursory search. I did find him, near dusk, after following a now familiar spiraling trail. I reached the unnatural giant tree that once held the guide's belongings. It was fresh marked with jagged irregular cuts that exposed the rotting heartwood beneath. The cuts went high into the boughs, and I had to strain my eyes to see, but what I finally made out made me suddenly ill. The boy lay cradled in two high branches, with his limbs dangling and cracked in a dozen false joints. His head was twisted completely behind him, like he sought to imitate an owl. One glassy eye stretched wide next to an empty socket, and his tongue lulled from his frozen jaw. He is owed a Christian burial, even a papist such as him. But I'll need to fell the tree to fetch his body. I wish I had the strength and will to do it now. But the night of lost rest before, and the day's gruesome business, robs me of the desire for much besides sleep. September 17th. I'm leaving this place. I lose all that I own. But if I leave in a few hours with the safety of the dawn, I leave with my life. I'll see my wife and boys again. I woke up this morning to a filthy gray dawn that never turned blue, but only drizzled the thin vapor of rain. The idea that I ever could have dreamed of living here sickens me now. I sat all day on the porch of the house, the very ground of the meadow looking threatening. The jagged teeth of trees against the gray sky and the lapping of the puddled water in the wind gave me the uncanny feeling of being inside a gargantuan maw that has been closing down on me since the moment that I arrived. I was still determined then to reclaim this land, to fill the bog and fell the trees and make the fertile black soil work under my plow. How foolish. With a fall of night came a whipping wind buffeting me with heavy damp air. When the last thread of light had been cut, the hound stood to his feet and strained against the leash, hair on end and teeth bare. He strained on the leather leash that held him and began to growl. It was a low, menacing sound. I looked to where he struggled to lunge, but could see nothing. No horizon between ground and forest, or forest and sky. Just blackness. When the leash broke, it made a popping sound like a firecracker, and the hound bolted into the black. I heard the angry rhythm of his barking as he was absorbed into the dark. And then, it stopped, and I heard a sharp squeal. 
and then silence. The crowding throng of life that I had felt each night before was utterly silent. The only sound, the dry rustle of the pine. I shouldered the rifle and fired once into the dark, and my skin rippled as my insides froze. In the bright flash of the rifle, I saw a phantom impression of the world inside the gloom, pale trees and wet earth, and I saw, clearly, the corpse of the hound, wet and glistening. Beside it was the shape of some foul thing. Crouched on crooked legs like the limbs of some beast, it held some dark portion of the dog in its splayed fingers. It was upright and looking straight at me. All I saw of his face was a bright diamond glint of two eyes and teeth. So many teeth. The gunshot rolled down the valley in darkness, and I heard no movement from the blackest beyond. With all the speed I could muster, I fled for the cabin and barricaded the door with every crate and unused hearthstone I could find. Gripping the rifle tight, I did my best to lay perfectly silently, and swore to leave at first light. When sleep finally came, it was fitful, and I awoke only a few hours later to a strange pinprick burning on my neck. I came awake to find the head of the dog perched like a trophy at the top of the barricade, which yet lay intact and undisturbed. Around me were the hellish tracks of some beast, wet mud shapes that defied identifications. I put my hand to my throat and felt a line of small drops across it, blood welling up from the delicate scratch that ran from ear to ear. The room was empty and still fortified from within, but it had been here with me just moments before. It had marked me, toyed with me, and then left. And so, at first light, I will leave. September 18th I'm ten miles from the cabin and I curse myself for a fool. With the morning sun, the meadow steamed and felt somehow safer, but still I packed my lightest valuable tools and I left the cabin. Five miles down the road, doubt set in. I've stopped to eat on the small bluff looking out at the glory of God's creation, and I have made up my mind. Reading yesterday's entry flushes me with shame. <laughs> what a coward I was. Whatever that thing is, it's a beast, and me, a soldier. I will hunt it, trap it, and kill it. What God and Grant could not grind out of me, I will not relinquish to some wild animal. I will not leave my wife and sons paupers. I'll be a man. I will return. June 29th, 1869 Mrs. Augustine Shelby, Grand Hotel, Cheyenne, Wyoming. Dear Mrs. Shelby, we recently received the enclosed from a pair of hunter who discovered it in the forest of the Front Range in Colorado Territory, having been made privy to the issue of your missing husband. We felt it was best to inform you directly and pass on his journal and a few other possessions. The hunters describe the area in which they found the items in a way that agrees exactly with your husband's description in the journal. But there was no cabin, nor foundation, or any other signs of habitation. We are deeply sorry that we could not be of more assistance to you, and I pray that your husband will eventually be found. Signed, Deepest Regrets, Colonel Benjamin Williams, Fort Collins, Colorado Territory.